Thank you, sir. So very warm good evening. Um, I welcome all the audience uh, to this episode of the Know Your Regulator series where every month uh, we are in conversation with um, a regulator and um, it has been our endeavor to bring uh, forth a mix of all regulators. And it's also a pleasure to sort of, uh, you know, rope in the State Electricity Regulatory Commission. Uh, last time we spoke uh, with uh, Mr. Preman Dinaraj from uh, Kerala State Electricity Regulatory Commission. And we are very happy to now be speaking with the chairperson of the West Bengal Electricity Regulatory Commission. As we all know, electricity is a concurrent list subject with a federal dimension in the sharing of power and responsibility between the center and the states. Uh, this is, of course, reflected in the structure of electricity regulation in India. And of course, the Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, the CERC, regulates tariffs for generating companies owned or controlled by the central government, those with an interstate dimension and those concerned uh, with interstate transmission of electricity. On the other hand, the State Electricity Regulatory Commissions regulate tariffs for generation, supply, transmission, and wheeling of uh, electricity within the states. So the state electricity boards, uh, of course, were set up by the Electricity Supply Act 1948 to oversee generation, transmission, and distribution of activities. These were the backbone of the electricity infrastructure and controlled about 70% of electricity generation and almost all distribution uh, by 1991. Uh, state governments performed the tariff uh, setting role and the decision on electricity pricing was often made with political considerations and this led to a sharp deterioration of the financial condition and the management practices of SEGs. In our previous episodes, we have learned how each state uh, electricity regulator controls, um, regulates its own um, state as far vis-a-vis -vis all of these challenges that are posed to it. Uh, today, we'll be talking with the chairperson of uh, the West Bengal Electricity Regulatory Commission, Mr. Sutheeth, uh, sir. And um, uh, of course, the WBRC has been constituted by the government of West Bengal uh, under Section 17.1 of the Electricity Regulatory Commission Act. Uh, to begin uh, today's session, we have with us uh, the Director General and CEO of IICA, Mr. Praveen Kumar. Uh, briefly about Sir, uh, Sir has assumed the charge of DG and CEO of the IICA in December 2021. He's a 1987 batch retired IS officer of the Tamil Nadu cadre, And Sir has headed various responsibilities in the government of Tamil Nadu and government of India in multiple departments such as finance, elections, industries, education, corporate affairs, new and renewable energy, et cetera. He has also headed a number of state and central public uh, enterprises, uh, including TANMAG and TNSL. And so is uh, leading IICA to a wonderfully new uh, direction. And we're all, um, and he, he's been very, very supportive of uh, the Know Your Regulator series. Uh, over to you, sir, for a few words of encouragement. And uh, thereafter, we'll begin our panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Abhayar. And a very good afternoon to Mr. Bhattacharya. Uh, I don't know whether I have met you in one of those meetings in CERC when I was additional secretary, MNRE, where state uh, electricity uh, regulatory chairman used to come in a meeting with the whole regulatory chairman. So we used to go and present the renewable energy perspective uh, to the state electricity regulatory commission. So I don't remember what it must have, I don't know. Or, uh, and uh, Arkaja, I think you are permanent. Uh, we keep on meeting every month in you know, your regulator series. Uh, as I have stated earlier, that uh, the regulation area is a new area which has come to dominate the economic landscape. Because earlier, governments used to do everything uh, decide the pricing, decide the, uh, what, what is to be how much is to be produced, at what price it is to be produced, everything. Uh, with the deregulation of the economy in 1991, where the free market started having a free play, then we had to take care of the distortions in the market, which, which is this free market brings in all. So this concept of regulation became prominent and electricity sector is one sector which has been right from 2003 Electricity Act, the regulation had come in uh, in this sector. 
even though it continues to be dominated much by the government, either by the most of the distribution and transmission being in the government sector, most, not all, and large amount of generation also being in the government sector. But still, here also a lot of stakeholders are involved, right from the producer of electricity, uh, the consumer of electricity, the government, uh, and the transmission uh, the transmission uh, entities, and the regulator has a very major role to play uh, in the in the in getting an equilibrium between the interest of all the stakeholders. And uh, uh, second thing that electricity being in going on has a big overlap with the various uh, other regulatory be it competition, be it housing, where the lines have to go right to the real estate issues, or uh, there has to be a overlap with the real activities. And that is reflected in that, uh, in fire, the maximum representation is from this sector. Most of the regulators are from the electricity sector, right from CERC, and I think all the state electricity regulators are there. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharya was the right person to state that uh, how as a regulator where government interest is also very much there in terms of fixing because still people think if the tariff is increased they don't blame the regulator they blame the government i mean that that feeling as well, if the tariff is increased and uh, uh, so there must have been and he must have faced either direct or indirect or felt pressure not to uh, upset the cart too much when revision of tariffs come, especially when the distribution company, the production company is also in the government sector and they also get a mandate not to uh, have a submit tar tariff uh, demands which are very high that I have seen in my state, I mean, not West Bengal, maybe Simla, I don't know. So, uh, that will be a very interesting series with uh, Mr. Bhattacharya. I think he will like to dwell both on challenges in the electricity sector and also challenges in overlap with the other regulators which you will face. With that, I will stop because uh, I would like to hear Mr. Bhattacharya more than to hear from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya. And okay, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Praveen sir. This has been uh always a great uh, start and this consortium between uh, India and um, IICA as well as uh, FOIA and uh, Center for Policy Research, I think is leading to some excellent conversations with regulators every month. Uh, without further ado, let me, let me introduce today's panel. We have with us the chairperson of the West Bengal Electricity Regulatory Commission, Mr. Sutirtha Bhattacharya. Uh, sir is a 1985 batch IS officer, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Telangana cadre, graduated from Presidency College, Kolkata, and sir is of course chairperson of the West Bengal Electricity Regulation Regulatory Commission today. Uh, before joining WBRC, sir served as principal advisor, infrastructure, government of West Bengal. Sri Bhattacharya was the chairman and managing director of Coal India Limited. Before taking over the charge of Coal India Limited, he was the uh, CMD of state-owned uh, Singareni Collieries Company Limited, SCCL. In his career, Sri Bhattacharya has served as Commissioner of Industries and the Secretary in Charge of Irrigation Department, amongst other posts. As uh, CMD of the Andhra Pradesh uh, Government's Transmission Company, he was Chairman of the Andhra Pradesh Power Coordination Committee. As Principal Secretary Energy, he was uh, the CMD of AP uh, Genco. As Principal Secretary Infrastructure and Investment at Andhra Pradesh, uh, Sir successfully executed port, airport, natural gas, and many public-private partnership projects. Sir has also uh, functioned as CNMD of Andhra Pradesh Renewable Energy and Andhra Pradesh Gas uh, Corporation. In recognition of his contribution, Sri Bhattacharya has received many awards, including the Best CEO PSU Award for Public Sector Enterprises by Forbes. Under his leadership, CIL has achieved India Today Award of fastest growing PSE and also achieved excellence in coal sector award. We are esteemed, uh, we are honored to be uh, in your presence, sir, and we know that uh, there's a lot, of, lot to learn from the conversation today. 
uh, we also have uh, our fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Ashwini Swain and Ms. Arpita Singh, who are both uh, fellows at uh, the Center for Policy Research. We look forward to this uh, discussion. And with that, uh, I'll mute myself and over to the panelists for a discussion. Over to you, Arpita. Thank you. Thank you, Abha. Thank you, Mr. Praveen Kumar. Um, Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, uh, you know, in this series that we call Know Your Regulator, we want to know the regulatory institution and the people and, you know, the people and how that regulatory institution is structured. So, you know, a little bit inside the regulatory institution, often regulatory institutions are only seen as the outside in terms of what they do and what outcomes they achieve. We want to look a little bit behind that and understand the people who uh, who run those regulatory institutions. And so, sir, starting from you, uh, Ababa has given us a nice, you know, long kind of uh, you know, elaboration of your background. And I think, you know, that's a good place to start and think about, you know, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience and your engagement with the electricity sector, which is, I think, I mean, you know, evidently a bit older than your engagement with the Electricity Regulatory Commission. Thank you. I must thank uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar, my colleague from the Tamil Nadu Canada. I perhaps we had not met, but I heard about him adequately. And my compliments to you, Mr. Pradeen, and my thanks to you. Thanks to CPR, who which, I mean, other than IICA, because IICA is the first place where I took, when I joined the regulatory commission, I took all the people for trading there. And the CPR has brought a rare amount of intellectualism into the segment or perhaps a kind of way you can be taken outside the room and be allowed to look at the room. I mean, you know what I mean. And I also compliment you for organizing this. I had heard Mr. Pujari also when you had organized. And it gives me really a, I mean, I feel really privileged that, you know, you, you I mean, you have given us time to talk and I thank the fire. And uh, I must tell you that, as you rightly diagnosed, I've been a regulator for very little time, but I have been on the other side of the table for most of the time. So as you were telling, the, you know, the objective is that people get to know by the regulators what they are doing. In those days, we seem to, we, you know, used to feel the regulators are known by what they are not doing. So the, perhaps that same kind of Thing continue. Power is a very, very vital sector. As you pointed out, I mean, the <clears throat> coordinator pointed out in the beginning only, it is a subject on the concurrent list, touches everybody's life in the true sense of the term. Like, you know, sales advertisement, if you recall that in everybody's life, there is a molecule of steel. So here, there are electrons are basic fundamentals in everybody's life. So this is a sector which arouses sensitivity, which arouses all kinds of reactions and, and too many people, too many stakeholders are interested in. If you look at the evolving of the sector, the Electricity Act 2003, following the Orissa reform, following the Andhra Pradesh reform, following the West Bengal under 17-1 when the Regulatory Commission came. All these are the initial reforming states which led to the unbundling, as all of you are aware. And the regulatory mechanism started growing. There were lots of teething problems in the beginning. And because you had told me to talk about the sector, the per capita consumption was less. Then it was targeted how to increase the per capita consumption, how to reduce the loss. Biggest challenge was originally, if you'd all recall, we all out in the even sector, the transfer of the assets, distribution of the assets, employees' uh, resources, retaining resources, signing power purchase agreement, recognizing that the private sector, because the generation was not licensed, recognizing the margins of the private sector as a major generator and going through 
how to reduce the power cost, power purchase, how to modulate the power purchase. These were the initial challenges which engage the sector, disputes engage the sector for us. From there, we have come to disruption area. I will not go Tony Sheva, which I mean, I mean, you know, all of you, all of us know. But perhaps we are right now in the throes of disruptive effect that are going to come in the source of energy, in the way people will use power, in the way it will be consumed, in the way we look at it. In the way we look at it, perhaps the things are going to change future regulators who will be coming, they'll have to have people with very different kinds of skill sets. If you, if, I mean, you know, many people who have worked in the electricity sector, electricity was identified with electrical engineers and mechanical And some person, and I mean, as all of you know, ask anybody, right from TL Sankar days and everybody days, we know how it used to continue. But today, communication, information, the analysis of artificial intelligence, smart grid knowledge, the integrational uh, kind of scheme, they have become significantly important. That is what I feel the traverse path has led me to that. So if you may, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it's fascinating what you're telling us, but, you know, since a lot of people don't actually know what's inside WBRC, it would be nice to, you know, also, ex you know, explain a little bit about the organizational structure of the, elect you know, so the role of the Electricity Regulatory Commission, you've told us quite a lot about the role that they played in the, you know, in the historical transition, but who are the people who played this role, you know, and, and you know, the current composition and structure and what are the types of people inside the commission? And Akaja, if I may yeah, add yeah. to this question, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, we, as Ava pointed out, we have already spoken to then chairperson of CRC and Kerala State Electricity Regulatory Commission also. So our audience know a bit about uh, the difference between regulation at central level at state level so but as you also pointed out kerala as west bengal is an interesting state as well so in terms of on many things the state has done things first starting from first demonstration of electricity to on many things the state has registered central prescription also successfully like you said on the uh, 90s reforms particularly and on certain issues right now, there is also not consensus between the state and center. So given that, do we uh, have any structural difference mm. between West Bengal and other state regulatory commissions? Mm. Um, uh, if you can reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I thought the commission was well introduced by the, you know, by the chair CRC, Mr. Pujari, and our uh, chairperson Kerala. All the commissions of the state are evolved on the same pattern because the although these commissions are constituted under the West Bengal Regulatory Commission Act, which got protected under Section 82 of the Electricity Act, mm -hmm. the composition is a three-member commission. In the state, there are three-member commission. Now, one member is vacant at the moment. It will likely to be filled up shortly. There is a judicial member, I mean, who is a part of our commission. And in addition to that, the, I mean, you know, now that you have raised the question, I had been to see the London Commission when I was not in the Commission, when I was in the other side. I was in the electricity, discom and transport side. Mm -hmm. And what a huge kind of commission. I mean, we got really worried, I mean, you know, and they are doing all kinds of research and all kinds of analysis. At the moment, these commissions are quite lean. There are three advisors coming from different areas. Like we have somebody who is retired from ACDC, I mean, the DISCOM, somebody who is in service but is on deputation from Chenko, and somebody who is an ex CEM. The technical expertise is quite balanced. Financial expertise is also quite balanced, either on deputation and retired from sufficiently senior people. And they are at this, in this commission, they did not have a regular recruitment, but we have recently made regular recruitment of young technocrats, who I'm sure will be strengthening. Problem in the commission is 
the commission per se sometimes does not show that kind of career potential to the young people because it is a small commission so ultimately the pyramid will be very very sharply acute so as a result most of the time most of the commissions they depend upon uh, the either people on deputation which very good people you have to really fight uh, with the uh, utilities to get the best out of them because nobody wants to give the best that is all said and done i mean you you really have to impress upon them to prevail over their natural uh, kind of resistance and go by the consultancy act which the electricity act gives you the freedom but even in consultant what happens is the the very good consultants are consultants to large number of entities so getting them in a dedicated manner is difficult so that is why you know i mean uh, there was a talk that you know create a regulatory service cadre and let those regulatory service cadre go through the different state regulators and central regulators like central regulator does not as you are saying what is the specialty of a state the the state regulator only deals with the interface of the utilities and the consumer the distribution utility is a exclusive prerogative of the state regulator and finally it, it uh, the distribution utility is the as a direct interface with the consumer so if you really look at the consumer if you really look at the consumer even say the other issue the state regulator and their created institutions really matter and so could, could you tell us a little bit about how the electricity sector is organized in west bengal how much of it is public how much of it is private yeah, i am coming to that so as a result what happens is in west bengal primarily the major issue here is a large number of utilities and i mean in west bengal what has happened is historically the procurement of the power and other thing the section 63 was not in i mean till i mean the section 62 when the cost plus power was in that means the regulator has to go on you know determining their annual tariff and annual cost in a regular manner so when that number of utilities are high there are small small plants and utilities owning small plants the task of the commission repetitive task of the commission becomes huge now who are the public sector obviously state discom is there but calcutta electric supply is done by csc which is a very very old discom which is a very very old discom and west bengal has a very interesting area west bengal has hydel in the north west bengal has coal and west bengal has a pump storage also which most of the rest of india doesn't have in addition to west bengal has dvc is a joint entity between let us say the central government state of west bengal and state of jharkhand at the moment and there are west bengal power development corporation the state jinco state transmission is there and there are some dedicated transmission lines of the private generator who supply to uh, directly to the private discom and there is another very small distribution utility called ipcl which is located in durgapur area so there the most interesting part of west bengal comes there is a common distribution utility area that means there is an area in bengal where there are three utilities operate in the same license west bengal utility damodar valley corporation which is a distribution utility but it doesn't really go down to the domestic consumer its clientele is most industrial consumer and that's that's, that's how they enjoy tariff advantage compared to others because their loss is less and there is ipc so the ceiling tariff provisions and other kind of interesting things which perhaps are not so prevalent in other states they are found in bengal and found in maharashtra 
That's great. And uh, uh, yeah, so thanks for that. I mean, thanks for, I mean, two things that you said why are, that were really interesting. One, you know, it comes up across many of our conversations with regulatory commissions, not just in the electricity sector, but everywhere that the commissions, you know, their staffing is quite small. And so the, you know, the career trajectories and the kind of, you know, job market in regulatory jobs is not perhaps, I mean, you need highly specialized, highly capable people, and the job market is not as well developed or as well integrated as it could potentially be. And I suppose the prospects for promotion are also kind of, you know, there aren't too many, the organizations are small, and there is, uh, I mean, there seems to be very little movement between the body, the staffing of the commissions and the commission's members. There are very few instances of people getting being promoted from the body to becoming members of the commission. So this was, I mean, this was something I think uh, you know across many of these regulatory conversations, this this issue is coming up. And the other thing about the specificities of each state and you know how much they vary, and you know, but all the states also have you know there is the you know the the basic you know kind of balance between what the regulatory commissions do the balance between social responsibility affordability reliability and the kind of you know financial aspect the sustainability of the businesses and you know so if you could you know if you could perhaps you know give us a little kind of perspective of how that balance is made and what the key considerations are from the chairperson's perspective the biggest challenge is, I mean, uh, to, to tell you very frankly, which has been deliberated in FOR, because, you know, we wrote to FOR and Mr. Pujari was very prompt in constituting a task force on how to reduce the cost of energy. If, how to reduce? Now, all of us say the cost has to be increased. I mean, the challenge is when you talk to a consumer, and much that we argue that I mean, you know, the other costs have gone up. He somehow does not get convinced that he is not being overcharged for power. I mean, whether one likes it or not, that's the perception that perceives that uh, that persists. I have seen it in Andhra Pradesh because in I mean, you know, in all its format, I was associated with power for a long time. I see the similar kind, and there is no difference at all in the kind of view of the consumer's group, consumer's association, and base code level. Second issue that uh, we'll have to, I mean, you know, what require, I mean, where the pressures come, and where the synergy and synthesis both required to be done are the demands of the various competing sectors. Like industry says, uh, you make me cost to serve you. The you know, the average cost to serve, which a cost which is being which normally is used to fix up the rates. The there are many people who operate at a higher voltage level. They feel that it should be the cost to serve. That is at the voltage level. So that is one, and there are different industrial segments who consume high electricity. Their perception sometimes happens, saying that if I consume more across the world in market, I get a bulk discount. And here, if I consume more, I am penalized. I mean, that's a dichotomy in the sector because it really does not get reduced. Bulk consumption at industrial level, although it gives a stable load, it brings down the losses. It makes the collection much easier, but at the same time, if you really see the broad tariff structure, it is quite agonistic to that. In fact, things may increase, thinking that it is a rich consumption. That is another idea that comes. What is the quality of power? That is one of the issues where the that there is a feeling that the areas which are a little bit remote areas, which I quote, are not so influential within stocks, they perhaps don't get that some, same kind of quality of power. Whereas the infrastructure gets concentrated in areas, which perhaps is not called for in the load analysis kind of scenario. So A, 
in the energy price there there are issues be in the kinds of energy you now there are young people who say why don't we get green there are senior people who say no what will happen to the you know the already i mean i mean the already assets which we have got what will happen if we unnecessarily promote we are getting we are not calculating the cost of renewable properly so there are dichotomies all around one view you say there will be definitely a group which will have a different view and for the right reason it's a vibrancy that is where the regulator job even the government's job becomes a little bit difficult because perfectly it is impossible to get a non dichotomous view that's the major challenge the regulator faces yeah and the state regulator has the consumer at the inter precisely as, as you rightly point out and um, uh, post bengal uh, is uh, also an important case here because the state didn't have as much uh, growth in industrial and commercial demand as compared to residential demand so because of that what kind of redistributive pressures you have in the state and how the regulator manages that and i also want to bring in i mean earlier it has been that cni consumers pay more so that the cost of electricity could be low for agriculture and low income households but now we are also shifting towards a different regime where the state governments are coming up front offering subsidies and uh, recently there has been i mean the prime minister critic that and uh, delhi chief minister who has been on the forefront of uh, universal household subsidy he also pushed back saying why that's important so i mean we want to understand what is the redistributive pressure in west bengal electricity sector and simultaneously your views about the shift from cross subsidization to state government providing more subsidies i mean i think you have i mean i mean this is an area as i said if in electricity sector if there is a view x there is a view minus x yeah so like you know i come from the state of andhra pradesh uh, and now there is the state of telangana the two state both believe in massive agriculture subsidy given by the government yeah right? and agriculture is not metered also as a result you really do not know whether you are subsidizing the con- consumption or whether you are subsidizing the loss also because x plus y is uh, equal to a figure and two variables one constant equation is not solved right yeah. so it is i in my view it is the decision of the state government as per the electricity act also to give subsidy to any kind of uh, class of consumers without differentiation between them whom they think in public interest their consumption should be subsidized that is one part of it the cross subsidy in many states you know i won't name them i know they are sometimes far beyond 20% in west bengal i mean I'm happy to tell you that we have been able to retain mostly within that plus 20% that means cross subsidize and to across the ratio is not more than 1.2 you know what i mean so that is what but that is where you have actually i mean you have i mean you are expressing my angst so when the industrial load does not really grow and even the commercial loads grow i mean it, i am not saying the commercial load doesn't grow it grows but industry is a much bigger uh, concentrator of load than a commercial load you all know yeah. we have to look at electrical vehicles now how they really how they really come up whether there will be a big bang kind of uh, development in that we really don't know we don't know mm-hmm. but the point at issue is that put stress on the capacity of cross subsidy on the extent of cross subsidy is impossible so that's the stress that we under because had it had there been huge kind of uh, in tax and industrial load to get that same kind of subsidy for the other sector by a cross subsidizing route things would have been easier yeah so as a result i mean the cross subsidy is within that limit of 25% 
बट माइग्रेशन टू लेस कॉस्ट सब्सिडीज बिकम उटली so um, and west bengal also has executed those provisions so what has been your experience with uh, cgrf and ombudsman mechanism uh, and um, uh, how, how does those decisions factor into regulated decision making in the one good thing here is we had been able to maintain the appointment of ombudsman on time and we have been able to see that the district level for us which, which you know they have and the centralized given federal forum as the arrangement here it is meant the horse of the new rule that have worked well and primarily what we have found is that in the ombudsman court if there are references in most of the cases if there is an i mean you know ombudsman is you know first they give a provisional order then people give their comment then they get a final order between the two parts many of the cases get complied so that means the regulation and sometimes even the utilities they go beyond regulation what they could have perhaps contested also sometimes they contest don't contest but having said that there are also quite a number of cases where we see some kind of intransigence from the utility in those cases the i mean we you know we had a very well contested case which i went right up to the apex court the ombudsman had also given compensation compensation to be recovered from the utilities and to be given to given the consume agreed consume and that right of the ombudsman has been upheld the right of the ombudsman has been upheld mostly people and second thing that is the reason many times the the compliance because of this regulation and our support to the ombudsman institute and the judicial support for that gets certain uh, things quickly sorted out and we have also utilized the section 142 platform to empower the ombudsman saying that ombudsman's order is as good as commission's order so we will take the violations of ombudsman order under section 142 as violation of commission okay. so now we can probably move to the mm-hmm. next segment uh, which um, ava in her introduction mentioned about electricity being a concurrent subject and uh, the federal arrangement for governance of the sector so uh, to to start with uh, uh, it's not just uh, the legislative uh, jurisdiction over the sector is said but also the resources key resources which are uh, critical to the sector are shared between center and state so for example one area which you managed is coal uh, uh, coal is a resource managed by the central government Uh, so given that how difficult it is for state regulators uh, to to regulate for the um, retail tariff particularly so because the wholesale um, purchase and fuel purchases from different agencies and the, uh, there are various political economy factors uh, influencing there so but ultimately the retail tariffs are fixed by the state regulatory commissions so how how complicated that is and i'll cite that in um, in april so we had this coal crisis where several states struggled to ensure power and even if there was power ensured then the co- there was various cost factors either imported coal or gas a spot market purchase so uh, ultimately everything will come to the state reg- regulators when they have to decide retail tariff so can you reflect on that aspect yeah this what i should say is the main resources that are shared what is coal 
I mean, there is school India which supplies school, or let us say Signal which supplies school by the linkage, by auction. There are, these are the two means under which the supply comes, either by linkage or by e auction. Transmission line, yes, because there will be transmission costs which will come from the power network. Basically. And there will be central generating stations whose tariff will be determined by CERC, whose power is purchased by the state discount. These are the three components. The West Bengal has done well in the coal sector. You might have seen the West Bengal has been really able to leapfrog many people in opening the coal mines. As a result, when the crisis came, West Bengal was not so perturbed because West Bengal had a reasonable, the WBPTCL who had the captive mines, they did excellent work in making available cheaper coal, and it was their coal. So they could control the, both the quality and the quantity. That was that actually is a big takeaway from the coal allocation and the center giving the resources, state acting very fast to get the resources to themselves. And this is how things can progress. It's a classic reflection during the so-called crisis because of lack of coal supply. The West Bengal, was not so badly affected at that point of time. Yes, sometimes the expensive power had to be purchased perhaps, but the own coal, captive coal of WPDCL helps. Having said that, there is one issue which happens is the transmission, which many of us feel that the, now of course the CERC has given a new tariff formula. So given this tariff formula, we'll have to see how it goes. But otherwise, what happens is the central tariff looks much higher. I mean, the paying charges looks much higher at this prime office than the equivalent of the state share. Perhaps because large sectoral investment has been done. But the state sees that it has not been done here. So whether it was really required for me to get that central power, that's a question which perhaps is still agitating in the minds. Because we have been talking about the perception of the resource. The railways is another issue. I mean, you, you get coal, but then coal has to be moved fast. But railways have been working with the states for a long time. Because if they want land, I mean, and I think railway coordination, both with center and state, is quite reasonably good. There is a group which actually takes care of that. Yes, there can always be crisis. There can be always deficit. And as a result, the import of coal is likely to come. That, of course, will have a tariff implication on the retail tariff. We'll have to really see the central generators, what kind of orders of the CRC comes. For the state commissions, the input cost comes from the CRC for the so-called central utility procurement, NTPC and other procurement. So far as the state commissions are concerned, we then calculate for that particular power, we only calculate the internal transmission and distribution loss and cost yeah. and come to the cost to sell. So we are bound by the central tariff. The position is very clearly well. And, and this is also a position of law that the central commission determines the tariff if there is more supplier to more than one state. But it is the state commission which determines whether somebody should procure that power at that cost or so the prudence of purchase, the jurisdiction is of the state council, I mean, of the state council. So things are well laid down. CRC also, I mean, because of the frequent FR meetings, these issues, CRC always constitute working group. And the working group, actually, it integrates the rest of Indian state regulators and with the active participation of the central electricity regulatory commission, regulatory itself. So many issues which you feel in the regulatory level, there may be lack of coordination. It gets coordinated through this mechanism. Yeah, thank you. That's a really, I mean, that's a really important part of, I think, the regulators working together and working in coordination with each other. It's a, I mean, sort of really important, but far less visible aspect of regulation because people see the hearings and people see the orders, but they don't see all the, you know, the policy making coordination. And in that, you know, another dimension of it is the 
policy push towards a nationally integrated electricity market. And you know what that means for the SCRCs, how it will change their role and functioning, and what is the kind of agenda it lays out for the SCRCs. See, this is a one issue where we'll have to really see the outcome. Prime APC, it looked attractive. But we, we all look at, ultimately, as I say, the RK Lakshman's common man is outside my door. We'll have to see this action, how it will impact my country. One of my first commitments is to the cause of that state currency. So what, the outcome analysis is important, but Prime APC, the concept looks attractive. Suppose there was no national greed. See, when we were in the utility, we had great difficulties in getting power from the east and not to the south. But today, power is seamlessly flowing. So the national market is possible when there is a national kind of access to facility. So national kind of access to facility has developed. We will have to, I mean, definitely welcome any kind of movement towards a national market, duly protecting the interest of the state. That's and the a, regulators are quite, uh, I mean, uh, quite... <laughs> I, you know, seized of the issue. Precisely. That, uh, you made a very important point. I mean, to have an integrated national market, we need infrastructure uh, as much. So uh, infrastructure comes first, then we can have an effective integrated market. And market, as, uh, as we know, know, that it has been a long-term policy post for at least last two decades. And it's gradually unfolding. But now moving to the next segment. So what is... Um, also, uh, an immediate concern, India is already on the path of an energy transition. So, because of various developmental and climate imperatives, so we are sitting more towards clean energy-based uh, uh, electricity generation. And this is going to change the way the sector has operated so far. And it's not just the supply side interventions, but also on the demand side and management also. Uh, technology like blockchain, AI, everything is uh, coming in and we may disagree on the pace of uh, deployment, but these are coming. So uh, given that, uh, I wanted to observe, um, hear about your perspective on what do you think about uh, energy transition in West Bengal? So earlier we have heard uh, media reports that the state government has been uh, resisting some of the prescriptions from center, particularly on RE issues, uh, uh, renewable energy capacity addition issues. But what is your personal perspective on uh, energy transition in West Bengal? And how, when this uh, sort of energy transition happens, how that will change the role of regulators uh, in the mm. sector? And possibly, and just to add to that, you know, in I mean, just to give us a perspective of what you see are the challenges and opportunities for West Bengal in this energy transition. The renewable transition will happen. The question is how that path will come, what kind of geodesic will be traversed, is the question. And that's an important question. Because there will be some disruptive changes. But as you know, as a part of tariff policy, it is now contemplated by the government of India. Then around 43% of the energy comes 2030 should be consumed from the renewable sector. The concern of the East and Northeastern states is the renewable resources are very much lacking. Even if there is a renewable resource, the capacity utilization factor in the wind is almost very little. In solar, the capacity utilization factor will be very little because primarily uh, these are different kinds of lands, there's different kind of cloud potential. Azimuthal rotation will not really help. So there had been concern that the generation, as a local generation from renewable, the potential is extremely restricted. Now, West Bengal, we don't have wind, whether the offshore wind will be viable or not. These are, you know, the, these are sea wet forecasts. They'll have to come and then they will have to be implemented. If you have seen, the renewable wind originally grew in Tamil Nadu, as all of you know. Then it was in Karnataka, then Andhra, 
सब पार्ट इन महाराष्ट्र गुजरात सोलर इन एम पी राजस्थान गुजरात तेलंगाना आंध्र सो द द बेस ऑफ पावर हैज गॉन टू सम अदर प्लेस एंड टूडे वेन वी आर काउंटिंग द डिलीवरी कॉस्ट वी आर नॉट टेकिंग इन टू अकाउंट द ट्रांसमिशन लॉस एंड ट्रांसमिशन चार्जेस बिकॉज देर इज एन एग्जेम्शन फ्रॉम दैट दैट कॉस्ट इज बींग बॉन्ड बाय समबडी दैट कॉस्ट इज बींग बॉन्ड बाई लेटर से थर्मल so there had been no opposition to the new reform there had been concern at the kind of impact this pace at which the path is sought to be traveled what impact it will have and this issue is not in west bengal specific this issue has been deliberated there is a body of the east and northeast regulator forens it has been deliberated there so my point is as i said there the renewable will come you know and i know because it will not come only from ecological point of view it will come also from economic point of view. 17 rupee 90 paise was the tariff which we had when uh, it was in year 2010 because the solar tariff is a 2 rupee 40 to rupee 30 also so now as you say the west bengal has the benefit Of a 900 megawatt pump storage, and it is an ideal location in the district of Purulia for another pump storage. So West Bengal will have series of pump storages, and it can become the arbitrage for the renewable power system. So I mean, West Bengal is really looking at the opportunity. What was considered in 2002 to be a load relief solution. today it is one of the ideal renewable energy promotion and the renewable energy hub so give the time to the state it has infrastructure it will be able to store and it will become the hub for area distribution around us so you know we've been talking quite a lot about the uh, electricity regulatory commission's kind of developmental role i mean there's quite a lot of you know uh um, you know taking the sector from somewhere to somewhere that's always been envisaged as the role of the regulatory commissions but you know uh, the central government policy proposals now talk of light touch regulation i mean i'm not just in electricity but across many sectors and what is uh, i mean what is the scope for light touch regulation which are the places where or the kind of dimensions of electricity regulation where light touch regulation has potential and you know what does this imply for the electricity regulatory commissions yeah, i mean you of people call it light touch regulation light touch regulation only means that you will not become a, a kind of auditor you will become a system regulator there will be a relationship with faith between you and uh, whom you are supposed to regulate regulation should not not be considered to be an authoritarian term regulation should be considered to be a kind of public interest protection even for you and even for whom you serve i mean i can tell you let us say section 60 It took away the power of questioning the tariff if it is uh, done by a competitive bidder. There is a judgment of after in a Karnataka case, which says doctrine of indoor management: the regulator should be miles away from. So the present day regulators are quite conscious of these issues. So we build up only parameters, and then we have to go by. the declarations the declarations have to be truthful and primarily the utility should be encouraged to self regulate the so called light touch regulation presume responsibility nays and responsible and i think that maturity has arrived and i feel the doctrine of indoor management should be left aside the attitude of auditorship should be left aside But at the same time, utilities have to be responsible. Utilities also must understand, and that is what happens in light touch regulation: is the regulator does not become a dhobi mark. Your own role becomes significantly important in ensuring 
the parameter which you are claiming to satisfy. Appropriate tariff becomes your responsibility. You don't say that, oh, I mean, we did this, but it was approved by the regulator. It is not approved. Parameters are only approved, you have to be within the parameters. So it creates a much more vibrancy in the sector. That is why the light touch regulation says that it takes away the heavy hand. That is what is the light touch regulation. Yes. I also have one more question. Yes. Um, you know, so one of the, you know, to use another hand metaphor, since you talked about light touch regulation and a heavy hand, uh, the other aspect of regulation is uh, the, the role of regulatory commissions as a kind of, kind of a hand tying strategy by the government uh, in order to, you know, commit itself to, uh, to a regulatory path. And in that, I mean, I, you know, I think we've, we've kind of touched on this from the outside a few times in this discussion, but the divergences that may be there between the public sector enterprises or the state government's you know agendas and the regulatory commission and how how those questions you know where those questions are and how they might be resolved the act contemplates section 107 section 108 where the policy directions can be given where the the act contemplates where the subsidy will be given by the government so, I mean, the, both the government and the regulator are bound by the act. We are creatures of that. So, we go by that. I don't think there is any discordance in that shape of that. There can always be different perceptions when you look at things from different sides. I mean, there can be perceptions which can be different when you are in a public sector head and you are dealing with the government. But that doesn't mean that you are in a role like, you know, seven men of industry. It is not like that. No, no, of course, discordance, I mean, disc the discordances are few and sometimes tend to attract a lot of attention. But most of the work of regulation is to manage those, you know, manage those dis dissonances in a way that it comes together productively in, you know, in... So in I don't see the dissonances. That is what I'm trying to see. <laughs> I see everybody playing their role and we also have to synergically play their role. I mean, I mean, role playing should not be interpreted as dissonance. That is my point. We should all be within the statutory limits set for us by the Electricity Act since we are creation for the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vartacharya. This has been interesting insights. And uh, before we go to audience question, I wanted to ask, uh, given your experience in electricity as well as coal, I'm keen to ask a question. So when you, was, uh, you were heading CIL, I have heard you say, um, giving importance to preservation of ecology, particularly in case of coal mining. So the other side is we have a regulation um, a requirement in India for thermal plants to comply with environmental norms and the deadline has been moving. So because, because as a state regulator, you also regulate the GENCOs who are, who are based in the state. So what has been your experience? Uh, what is the barrier to compliance uh, uh, compliance with environmental norms uh, decided by CA? Can you can you tell us a little bit about trying for you from your insights from Australia? The generators are quite responsive because normally they are regulated in this aspect of state pollution control. Yeah. And if state pollution control board or the MOGF, they say you have to do your USP will have to be standard X, FGD will have to install. <laughs> The regulator goes all out to see that those capital expenditures, <laughs> and not only for us, every regulator goes all out to sanction that. We go by the CRC's uh, approach and the kind of benchmarking of values that CRC gives or CEA gives. But uh, it is one of the basic jobs of the regulator to promote the eco compatibility and safety. Exactly. So, uh, as I hear, the cost <coughs> factor, capital cost factor, has been the biggest roadblock for compliance. Uh, uh, that's what I say. We have to sanction the capex. These are called essential capex. These are not discretionary capex. To comply with the eco regulators' norms, like MOEF, Pollution Control Board, these are called essential capex. Yeah. And these are not at the discretion of the regulator at all. Regulators, they try to see they are cleared as fast as possible, duly keeping in mind the benchmarking norm of price or other standards. Let us say by CRC or CA, if there is any. <coughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, we have quite a few audience questions. And so we'll, <coughs> we'll take some of the questions from the audience. We have two questions from Arnab Day, who are both are related questions. <coughs> so I'll ask them together, excuse me. He says, wants to know how many officers are direct <coughs> recruitment, regular officers of WBRC Kader, and how many of these are engineers, CAs, LLB, MBA, <coughs> etc. <laughs> Pre recruitments have been done, I told you recently <laughs> directly. Two of them are techno engineering uh, technocrats, and one of them is a finance specialist. <laughs> okay. So, does uh, WBRC also depend on people um, uh, on deputation from utilities or? Uh, that's what I told in the beginning. The utilities. Uh, uh, yeah. So that's that's the case in many of the states. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bijesh Sonavane asks, uh, what about electrical accidents? Are there any state level accident reduction regulation? Is WBRC uh, <coughs> working on imp improving electrical safety? The, that is what I see. Electrical safety is at, under the statutory functioning of the Central Electricity Authority and the Chief Inspector of I mean, CID, <laughs> Chief Electrical Inspector. But we direct the licensees to scrupulously <laughs> follow the standards and norms set by them. And for eco compliance and safety compliance, the capex, they are not allowed, uh, they are not, no restrictions are put on the necessary capex. They are considered to be essential capex. Saurabh Modi wants to know what is the share of transmission in the total loss of electricity to the cost of electricity to the consumer? <coughs> How will this change in the future? In West Bengal, it is around 3%, but it, it depends upon the kind of uh, load center that it grows. <coughs> the transmission loss and uh, even the for WBAC DCL, PND loss have come down from almost 29% a few years back to. 18.5%. And the word CSC, it is <laughs> So, um, in, in, uh, in, in our discussion, you uh, spoke about um, CRC deciding uh, quite a bit of benchmarks, which is largely or preparing model regulations which is largely followed by state regulators. So maybe we can go back a little bit and try to understand how the coordination works between CRC and SCRC when a new kind of regulation or benchmark is introduced. So is it just the state regulators have to follow it or there is a co-development of those regulations or any consultation that happens or what are the forums for coordination between the regulators at two levels. Uh, model can... regulations are not really developed by the CRC. Model regulations are developed by forum of regulators. Exactly. Yes. The CRC chairperson is the chairperson. They constitute working group. We come out with forum of reg I mean, recommendation. Then mm -hmm. model regulations are done. They are circulated. And many of the regulators with perhaps some tweaking befitting the status of their state they go ahead with the adoption of it. That is that. That is the expectation. Okay. So I think you know. Is there? A, I think that we're. You know. Thank yeah. you. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, I also have some visitors. Yes. 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 Thank you so okay. much, Mr. Bhattacharya. That was really excellent, and thank you for agreeing to speak to us and to participate in this series. We've now had three conversations on electricity regulation. And we're hoping, you know, because it's, you know, we're hoping to have a few more because there's, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of different kinds of interest in electricity regulation coming together in this series. Um, and, you know, thank you so much for this and for, you know, for sharing so much of your, of your knowledge and your insights in here you know, with us and with the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Praveen Kumar, and thank you to the audience for your great questions and for your participation.
So we'll close the webinar now. And thank you, Pravin Kumar, Mr. Pravin Kumar. Thank you very much, and thank IIC. Thank you.